Hi, in today's video we're going to take a look at this Thermaltronics TMT9000S and many people have asked me to review some Thermaltronics stations because these are potentially a lower cost version of the Metcalf station that I normally use. Now the station that I normally use is the MX5200 with various hand pieces. Uh, that has been an excellent station. I bought it back in 2012 and it's been flawless in the uh, sort of 11 years that I've had it, still working perfectly fine. In fact, I bought another one, so I've got two of those together. Um, but this one is a 40 watt soldering station, so half the power. And in fact, Thermaltronics don't do an 80 watt version, so there's nothing that's actually a direct competitor to the high power Metcalf stations. So this one is 40 watts. It's got two outputs, but it's only switchable between the two. You can't use them both together like you can on the MX5200. Uh, this one is still an RF heating technology. This particular model uses 13.56 megahertz, uh, just like the MX5200, and the high frequency means that the cartridges are much more compact. There is a lower frequency version that operates in the, I think it's four or 500 kilohertz range, uh, a bit like another range from Metcal, and those cartridges are a bit chunkier because they need to have a physically larger coil for that resonant frequency to be in the mid kilohertz range. Now, uh, in terms of cost, this unit uh, from most retailers seems to be about £540, including VAT. A few places are selling it a bit more expensive and a few a bit cheaper, but that seems to be the average price for this unit. So certainly not a cheap system, and once you start adding cartridges in, obviously the cost starts bumping up. So um, this actually is exactly the same price as the Metcal MX500, which I don't think I've done a video on. But this is basically the same station. It's got two outputs, switchable uh, digitally actually in this case. It doesn't have a toggle switch like this. You can't use both of these at the same time. But this is also a 40 watt station and you can buy exactly the same setup, a handpiece, cradle and the power supply itself for the same price. It's about 400 and, uh, sorry, £545, so £5 more expensive. But these units are pretty much identical in size they both got that 2x16 LCD. And there's also a lot of similarities uh, between the systems. Now, unfortunately, I haven't got any packaging from any of the Metcal systems, but it's quite bizarre. They use exactly the same boxes. They've got these same silver stickers with the same font. So uh, I don't quite understand the link between the two. I'm assured that uh, Metcal don't manufacture these and it's a completely separate operation. But the boxes are exactly the same. These stickers are the same. The lead free sticker is exactly the same as well. So there must be something going on at the factory that means they share a few parts or something. Uh, but I'm assured they're very separate operations. So uh, what we'll do is we'll take a closer look at the individual parts. We'll take this unit apart and then we'll have a look at the soldering performance. But before we do that, uh, we're just going to have a quick segment from our sponsor for this video, PCBWay. So PCBWay is your one-stop shop for all your project needs. As you know, they offer a wide range of PCB manufacturing capabilities, including very cheap prototype PCBs, production level boards all the way up to 60 layers, and also rigid flex PCBs. They also offer PCB assembly services where you can get your entire PCB assembled with the components onto both sides of the PCB, as well as CNC fabrication. So don't forget to visit PCBWay.com. Starting with the handpiece and immediately after taking it out of the bag, it does feel very, very lightweight and flimsy. Nothing like the Metcal. Um, here's the Metcal one uh, that's supposed to be its equivalent. You can see it's kind of similar in design, but this one is full aluminium body. It's got a nice attachment to the flexible cord grip. It's aluminium at this end, and then we've got a really nice flexible grip here, which incidentally is the same grip that was fitted when I first bought this unit. I haven't had to swap it out despite the fact that I use this pretty much every day. So that's how this one stood up after 11 years. Unfortunately, this one just feels really cheap and plasticky in comparison. Now, um, this part is all plastic. This is rigid plastic, the grip here, although you can swap it out for these slightly more flexible grips, but it's nothing like the Metcal one. There's a green one for lead free or gray um, for lead, uh, but you can unscrew this and I will swap it out. I prefer the flexible grips. But as you can see, this is quite thin aluminium all the way down, and then it's got a heavy plastic coating, which I think just makes it feel a lot cheaper. It's certainly not got the same amount of metal as the Metcal. It won't affect the functionality, but it just looks like they're cutting costs just a little bit there uh, with that plastic coating. 
Now the silicone coax is exactly the same stuff that's on the Metcal, pretty much exactly the same. Um, still very, very flexible and obviously heat resistant as well. It comes with a silicone pad for removing the cartridges out of the handpiece. And these are quite handy, very similar. In fact, it's exactly the same design as the Metcal. They've just rebranded it with Thermaltronics. But these are really handy. It means you can swap out cartridges nice and easy while it's hot. Um, there's a really bad gluing job of the strain relief onto the plastic here. It looks pretty poor. Uh, and then at this end, we've got another strain relief and a screw-on F connector. Now, the Metcal F connector is a little bit different. This one requires you to screw it all the way home. The Metcal kind of have, has this quick connect where you can slide it on and then you just give it one full turn and it clamps it nice and tightly. So if you do swap out your hand pieces fairly regularly, you know, if you've got a desolder gun and some tweezers and that kind of stuff, I think this will get on your nerves after a short period of time. But there's nothing stopping you, as far as I can see, using a Metcal hand piece on the Thermaltronics base station. Here is a Metcal and a Thermaltronics cartridge side by side, very similar in design. Main difference is the Thermaltronics has a colour band which tells you which temperature range it is. I think they do three different ranges, red, yellow and blue. The Metcal you have to look at the model number to work out which temperature range it is. But as you can see it's got exactly the same connector on the end, very similar length and in fact you can interchange these cartridges in the Metcal MX system and also with the Thermaltronics. Unfortunately, you can't use it in the connection validation system. That has the little chip in it to tell it which cartridge it is for the connection validation to work properly, but you can use these between the two uh, other stations. Uh, in terms of cost, very similar, actually. Uh, the Metcal cartridges seem to have dropped in price. You can get these for a really good price on Farnell, often less than £25, and they do last really well. Uh, I've still got the same cartridge that I bought with the MX5200 all those years ago and it still works absolutely fine. Uh, I don't know about the Thermaltronics, I have got a couple of Thermaltronics cartridges but they don't get used anywhere near as much so I can't say how long they last um, but you should be fine. I, I don't think uh, I've heard any complaints in particular about these failing early. We'll just see how these fit in the handpiece. I don't expect it to be any different from the Metcal but they're free sliding up until about this point here and then you just push it home and it grips it nice and tightly and you can rotate the cartridge because uh, some of the uh, soldering stations have a keyed cartridge and it means that once you've got the natural sort of droop of the wire after a while you always end up holding this holding the soldering iron at exactly the same angle and if this is off at some weird angle and you can't correct it it gets quite annoying so that's all fine and this seems to all work as expected. Here is the cradle and the first thing to notice is it's actually a really big cradle. It goes back a long way. It's also quite wide as well. Here at the front we've got the area for the sponge for cleaning the tip. and We've also got a brass pad here uh, to clean off a little bit more heavy oxidation. Just here is where we place the handpiece and it's got a couple of magnets in here which you actually feel as you're putting the um, handpiece into the cradle. It wants to stick to the side so you don't have to push it through there. But that magnet changes the curie point of the cartridge and immediately drops the temperature. And then the moment you remove it, it heats up rapidly and goes back up to the operating point. So that saves the lifetime of the tip if you do leave it in the cradle for extended periods of time while it's still on. At the back here, we've got 10 spaces to store cartridges, should you wish to, very similar to the Metcal. The only thing really that's different is, first of all, uh, it's much larger. Fixed inside the Metcal, you can get rid of the sponge area if you don't use that and slide it underneath. And also, this has a fixed angle. On the Metcal, there's a, a thumb wheel, so you can adjust the angle that you place the handpiece into the cradle. This one is fixed at that 45 degrees. Here is the power supply, and this thing is very heavy, so there is a proper transformer in here. The whole thing feels quite well built. It's all made from cast aluminium, as you can see at the back here. Not been painted particularly well. Uh, but overall it looks okay. There's a few fit and finish issues. I'll zoom in on those in a moment. Uh, but generally it feels like it's built like a tank, just like the Metcals are. Uh, we've got the screws all the way through. We've got an IEC connector, a small fuse, 0.5 amps. So obviously that points towards it not being a switcher in here. Otherwise we'd have something a bit bigger to cope with the inrush current. Uh, but yeah, made in China, just like the Metcal. Single input voltage, 220 to 240. There is a 110 volt version available as well for those in America. Uh, but that's the back. At the bottom we've just got a tamper sticker. On the front 
we've got the power switch. Um, that's the same power switch that we've got on the Metcal, as you can see there, in the same location. We've got the same 2x16 blue LCD, although we do have an addition of an LED here. And then we've got the two F connectors with a switch to switch between the two. Here's a close-up of the side of the unit because uh, the problem with cast aluminium and casting in general is it's quite a rough process and then normally you'd go through some other machining process or some other finishing process to then clean it up because there will be imperfections from casting. But unfortunately the finishing here is pretty poor uh, and it's really quite inconsistent. There's marks all the way down the side here and then it turns into little pitted areas here. Um, around the LCD there's some imperfections around here and particularly you can see there's some distortion to the aluminium. Uh, unfortunately also the LCD is a bit marked up as well. I haven't touched this but there's these weird marks and it also looks like it's been wiped with someone's finger. Um, around the F connectors there must have been, oh, you can't see it very well on camera, um, but there must have been some imperfections and someone's filed it down because there's some rough file marks around here on both of these in this area here. This is all a bit loose. Uh, also the switch doesn't have a nice positive action. It doesn't feel like a quality switch for something that, uh, I'm not sure if it switches the 13.56 megahertz output directly or whether it switches some transistors, uh, but this doesn't feel like the greatest quality switch. But, you know, the, the whatever they use to sand it down, maybe a wire wool or something like that, is in this direction on this side and then it goes vertical along here. Also, this bottom ridge here, you can see there's a curve here but then it goes to a flat edge here. So it's just inconsistent across the front here. So just generally, the fit and finish of this isn't all that great. There's some marks around here. There's not even a screw hole there. The screw hole's in here, so I don't know what's happened here. This is fresh out the box. So just generally not that great. If I compare it to what the Metcal looks like, even though this is about five or six years old, they seem to have sandblasted it or something like that. Um, and it gets a, a much nicer finish on here doesn't look anywhere near as inconsistent as the Thermaltronics unit. This is what the unit looks like inside. So we've got two main PCBs. Obviously the one at the bottom here is the power PCB that's got the amplifier and the 13.56 megahertz resonant generator. We can see all the switching transistors and those inductors on there. Some big capacitors at the back there. Um, and I imagine this is very similar to the design uh, that we've seen. I think there's a design on the EV blog forum where someone's traced out the old MX500, um, probably very similar in design to that. Now we've got the big mains transformer at the bottom here, and it does look like we've got all of the primary taps. So if you bought the 110 volt version, it just looks like it'd be wired slightly differently. You can see the series connection there for the transformer in this 240 volt region. Uh, but that's good news. If you ended up with the wrong version or you moved house or something like that, you can reconnect this as per your supply voltage. And we've got a filtered IEC connector. We've got double sleeved wiring for the mains. Goes off to the fuse and also goes off to the power switch. One thing that happened on the early MX500s is for some reason the power switch was on the uh, secondary side of the transformer. So the transformer was always energized. That's not the case on this unit here. Uh, but yeah, this is very heavyweight owing to that very large transformer. Now there is another board at the top here which has a microcontroller on here, but as far as I'm aware, the microcontroller doesn't actually do anything useful. It just drives the display and possibly changes the sleep time. I'm not sure if this one has an actual sleep timeout, uh, but the power PCB is fully self-contained, so this will just run on its own. It doesn't need any input from this board at the top. So this board at the top is really just for displaying the amount of power being delivered to the handpiece. Now, on closer inspection, indeed, this switch at the bottom here switches the power output directly. So this flimsy slide switch is actually handling the 40 watts out to the handpiece, which I think is pretty poor, really. I'd much rather if there was some other way of digitally switching these outputs. Maybe that's not an easy thing to do at those kind of power levels. But given how crap this switch really does feel, uh, I wouldn't want to be switching this too many times before starting to worry about the switch contacts wearing out and this thing heating up because 40 watts is quite a decent amount of power uh, to be passing through one of these slide switches. Here's a close-up of that PCB at the top. It's got a little STC microcontroller, so a very low-cost 8-bit micro to drive that LCD. As I said, it's really not doing anything complicated. I think it just displays the power level and it must be able to shut down the main board for uh, standby 
as well as uh, for this thermal cutout that's on the PCB if the internal temperature gets too high. There's some electronics here, I think this just providing the analog input to the microcontroller, as well as a backlight control and contrast here. Uh, we've got a little switcher IC, an LM2575, the inductor over here and the output capacitor here, not the best layout overall, uh, but that's what's on that board at the top. Right, let's power this up for the first time. Let's turn it on at the top. And we've got version 1.2. And then we get a load bar. I think this is showing percent rather than watts. I think some of the Metcar units show how many watts is going in. And we've also got a green LED. If we flick this over to the open channel, uh, then it does notice that there's no cartridge inserted and we get a red LED. If we flip back, yeah, it detects that there's a cartridge and goes back to green. So it does mean we're able to hot swap cartridges without needing to power cycle the unit or anything like that. Let's check the calibration. Now this cartridge has a yellow band on it, which means that it's a 700 type cartridge, nominally 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but its actual temperature band is anywhere between 350 degrees C and 398 degrees C. So quite a wide band. It has a temperature tolerance at idle of plus or minus 1.1 degrees C. So whatever the calibrated value is between those two numbers, it should idle plus or minus 1.1 degrees C. So it should be pretty stable. It's just we've got a very wide band of acceptable temperatures from this cartridge. So let's see what it is. It's not cleaning off very well. Wow, it is taking a long time for this thing to heat up. That was probably about six or seven seconds there. Uh, it's coming off now. It took quite a long time for the cartridge to heat up properly. Uh, so a lot longer than the Metcal anyway. Let's see what the temperature is. So 386 degrees C. If I add a bit more solder, we do see that drop and then climb back up to 386, 387, we just caught at the end there. So, um, yeah, actually quite a hot cartridge. It's probably fine for lead-free, a little bit on the warm side for lead. Uh, that does mean on some of the soldering tests that we might just quickly do now, uh, this might actually have an easier job with it being set at a higher temperature. We'll be able to dump a bit more power into it, but let's see how it performs. So what we've got here is a little PCB that I had made a while back at PCB Way. This was kind of just a little test board. Uh, this is the first time I've actually got around to using it. But the idea is that we've got some heavy ground planes stitched together. And we've got one pad here that we place the soldering iron on. And then we've got uh, some temperature sensors on the board. And the idea is that we're measuring the amount of heat that is able to dissipate in this PCB from placing the soldering iron on this pad here. And we've got some really interesting results. Let's take a look at them. Here's the results, and we seem to have two groups of data. The lines at the top are the results from the temperature sensor closest to the thermal pad, 
and the lines at the bottom are the ones further away and we see a bigger temperature rise obviously with that sensor that's closest to the thermal pad. Now what I did was I used exactly the same cartridge and handpiece with each of the soldering stations so I've used this Thermaltronics M7CH250 and the H means this is a high power cartridge you can tell because it's got this kind of bulbous cartridge at the end. I used the same handpiece and I plugged this into the Thermaltronics into the Metcal MX500 and the Metcal MX5 200. And the results are showing that Thermaltronics is not delivering as much power as either of the Metcal systems. You can see the Thermaltronics is this line at the bottom here and similarly the orange line at the bottom here. And exactly the same test setup but with that sensor closest to the thermal pad we've got a difference of about 10 degrees C which is quite surprising really. This is supposed to be equivalent to the MX500. What's also quite interesting is the MX500 is delivering pretty much the same amount of power as the MX5200. So that 80 watt system is not able to deliver much more than the 40 watts that the MX500 is delivering. I think that's a limitation of the cartridge. If you recall, Metcal more recently released a special handpiece, the High Thermal Demand, which has some um, optimizations in the passives that are in the barrel here. And it's been optimized to use with these high power cartridges. And I think the idea is that really these small cartridges can't be used with higher powers. Um, and so you'll get very similar soldering performance with the MX500 and the MX5200 with the normal cartridges. But if you want that extra power you can from the 80 watt system, you can use this high thermal demand cartridge. But it's quite interesting really because... Uh, it looks like if you wanted to save money and you weren't planning on using simultaneous hand pieces, the MX500 looks to be a much better deal. So whilst the Thermaltronics is a perfectly good soldering station in its own right, the problem really is that although this used to be quite a bit cheaper than the Metcal, they've really bumped up the price of this system to the point where there's only five or ten pounds difference between this and the Metcal MX500. And the whole idea that people were uh, asking about this system is because there might be some money to be saved. But as we've proven, the performance of this is not as good as the Metcal MX500. And also subjectively, in my op opinion, I don't like the look of this unit as much. I don't think the build quality or the finish is as nice. I wasn't particularly fond of the cradle and also the handpiece itself feels a bit flimsy. So at which point you may as well just get the Metcal in the first place. Now, if you did happen to find one on eBay, even if you found a US version, uh, you can uh, change the taps on the transformer and use it and it would be a perfectly good soldering station. It just doesn't quite have the performance when you're pricing it pretty much exactly the same as the Metcal. So that's just my thoughts. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments section down below. A big thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. And if you've got any suggestions for future soldering stations that some of you are interested in having reviewed, then I can take a look at those if you put those in the comment section down below as well. But I hope you enjoyed the video, and until next time, thanks for watching.